Uh, the theme of our conference is communicating truth. My choice of topic is the truth, and I call them precious truths of biblical manhood and women. The problem, however, is that the subject of biblical manhood and woman is utterly and bitterly despised by our secular society, and I might say even by some of our dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to do a better job at communicating the truths of biblical manhood and womanhood and confronting the lies of society and lies even of some of our own Bible expositors. And we need to do this for the sake of our young people who are being bombarded by this day and night. Let me begin with a few Scripture passages. Ephesians chapter 5, for the husband is the head of the wife. Wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, I wouldn't advise you to put this on the front sign of your church or maybe on your website. You might find windows broken or a protest march. Let a woman learn quietly with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to ex authority over a man. A professor in an evangelical seminary on a class on the pastoral epistles gave all the different interpretations of this passage and then gave his pa uh, interpretation, which was affirming what Paul said, women are not to teach or take authority over men in the church. Literally, it created a riot. Students refused to go to class, and one student nearly attacked the teacher. Do you believe these verses I just read to you? If yes, what, are you crazy? This is going to destroy your church. This is offensive to our society today. People will think you're a male Neanderthal, a person from the dark ages, a social dinosaur living on the wrong side of history, a religious extremist that cannot possibly be taken seriously. So why in the 21st century, the century of the women, why would we believe these statements? The answer is, Jesus is Lord. As Lord, he is Lord over defining our gender roles. It is Christ, through his chosen apostles, who made these statements. In the context of the woman in the gathered assembly, Paul says this, knowing there would be a response to it negatively. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things that I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. We actually don't have a choice in this matter. It's a command of the Lord. And unless we want to redefine, reinterpret what the apostles say to agree with modern secular society, which sadly many of our dear, dear brothers and sisters are doing, we have no choice. Who wants a Bible that says one thing but actually means something completely different? Such twisting of the Scriptures undermines the clarity and authority of the Bible. It should make us all pause and question when we consider that these new interpretations of gender and sexuality and marriage and even penal substitutionary atonement all make the Scriptures fall in step with contemporary secular society. A tsunami of secular gender philosophy is flowing over our churches and especially over our young people who are most vulnerable to this. What are we to do? How do we protect our churches and our young people from being swept away by this flood? I want to give you nine points. Not nine marks, nine points. Number one, Dave, how am I doing on time? Keep going. Okay, keep going. Okay, i got to watch him. Sneaky. He's going to come up and back at me and stop me. All right, number one, number one, understand that there is a worldwide war against women. This war is far more serious than most of us realize. In the words of Time magazine, there are precious few female-friendly spots on the earth. The World Health Organization says one in three women around the world experience physical and sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner. The World Conference on Human Rights declares that there is a worldwide epidemic of violence against women. 
Get the facts. They're not very pretty. Do not be ignorant of the suffering women experience throughout this world with little hope of relief. Our hearts really should be broken. There should be compassion and understanding when we think of how women are treated throughout the world. This is not a joking matter, and we should not make jokes about the abuse women experience. It's your job to communicate this to your congregation. Second, acknowledge all that is good in the feminist movement and their efforts to see women treated fairly and justly. Many good things have happened for women in Western societies. We should love all that is good and righteous and fair. Many good things have happened in our society that we should be more than happy to acknowledge. I think of the care and the opportunities afforded today to those who have serious disabilities. Not all of secular society's efforts are bad, and let us not even insinuate such a thing. Three, and more pertaining to us right now, be consistent and persistent in teaching the biblical passages on the Creator's design for men and women in marriage, church, and society. Our people desperately need to know the biblical text on manhood and womanhood starting in Genesis 1 to 3. Do not make the assumption your people know these verses. They do not know these verses. It's our fault if they do not understand this teaching and they cannot defend it. Think about this. Many egalitarians have done their homework and are prepared to propagate their view in your church. It's happening all the time. Challenge your people to study this subject from the Scriptures, and they each and every one should be prepared to defend God's beautiful and good and righteous plan for men and women. Particularly urgent is the need to teach our young people that there is a Creator who made us male and female, and He is very concerned about this issue. Our young people are on the front line being bombarded by secular philosophy every day. I once saw a poster that said, if we don't teach our children to follow Christ, the world will teach them not to. Now, to help with this, particularly with young people, I wrote this book, Equal Yet Different, but notice the subtitle, A Brief Study, A Brief Study of the Biblical Passages on Gender. A number of years ago, I noticed our young people were coming back from Christian colleges, egalitarians, and they were very angry at us, thinking we had deceived them about men and women's roles. And I realized it was our fault. We did not train them. We did not prepare them. We did not take them into the text of Scripture to show them what God says and that what God says is really wonderful and beautiful for our pleasure and for His glory. Let's make sure we can change this. This leads to my next point, number four. Utilize the many excellent resources available to us. Now, a little bit of an assignment here. I want you to introduce either yourself or your congregation to Council for Biblical Manhood and Woman, Womanhood. www.cbmw.org and their journal, ACON. This site will update you on this subject continually and provide many helpful resources. Have their literature available for your churches. And I would suggest, this is such an important and relevant organization today, that you as a church and as an individual support this organization financially. Now, there's two statements I'm going to ask you to read. This is an assignment. And I'm very serious about this assignment. If you don't do it, don't come back next year. We may even have a test. <laughs> You're laughing, but I'm not. There's the Danvers Statement of 1988 on biblical manhood and womanhood. And there is the Nashville Statement, 2017, a coalition for biblical sexuality. Together, now here's the assignment. Very important. Get with it. As a leadership body, whether you're an eldership or whatever you call it, I am asking you to take these two statements and read them point by point over a period of time, even a long period of time, 
and discuss each point as you go through these documents. You, these are well-written documents, by the way. In fact, on the airplane, I read them over again. I read them a number of times. They are very well-written, explaining the biblical idea of a man and a woman and of our sexuality. So that is my assignment to you. Not many conferences will give you assignments. Most of them want you to relax and drink a lot of coffee. We're giving you work here so you have something to do. Also, I want to highly recommend Books for Your Church by Wayne Grudem. He is our leading scholar in this area of interest, men and women. He has done the most work. His books should be here and available to your people. I also want to re recommend another book, Women in the Church, 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15. This is the crisis text by Andreas Kostenberg and Tom Schreiner. An excellent book. It's in its third edition now. I've read the first and the third edition. It is, an, it is a, a response to um, evangelical feminists. And I think they do an excellent job showing how they have distorted the Bible. And then I want to remind you of a man named Al Mohler, The Briefing. Now, I know people say, oh, I get so uh, depressed when I listen to that. Well, that's fine, you get depressed. What about our young people? You need to hear this for your young people, for those you care for. Things are happening, changing so rapidly in our society. I believe Al Mohler is doing a great service to the church to keep us up on these things. So, be prepared. Be prepared. Do something. Don't just sit there drool. <laughs> Five, one should join, no one should join the church eldership or leadership body that has not been fully committed to biblical manhood and womanhood. Candidates for the eldership must be able to demonstrate to their fellow elders that they know all the relevant passages of Scripture and can explain them when tested. And they are to be tested. 1 Timothy 3.10. Write that down if you don't know it. Titus 1.9. All elders must be able to uh, instruct in sound doctrine. You're to test to see if they can. This is where we make our biggest problem. We do not train and test our leaders for the eldership or the deaconship. And then we have years and years of problems with people who don't know anything, They're ignorant of divine matters. No one should join the eldership who has not been fully committed to biblical manhood and womanhood and can defend it right from the Bible. Six, as a leadership team, discuss how you will handle male abuse of women and children in your church. This will be followed up by one of the other brothers. Have a plan. Be prepared to act. Don't be caught off guard. Don't say we didn't know what to do. Be courageous. Have a will to enforce God's standards of loving Christ-like headship. Meet as a team as soon as possible and prepare your plan for when, not if, this issue arises. Again, I want to make a suggestion, an assignment, I would suggest reading together the SBC resolution of uh, 2019 on the evils of sexual abuse. As a leadership team, or you can do it as an individual, read this. It's very, very well written, very scriptural. Be alert. Be prepared. Do not walk in circles when these horrible things happen in our churches. It's a failure of leadership, and we don't know what to do. There are Christian men who have disgraced the gospel by misusing the scriptures on headship to abuse their wives. They are the ugly examples that the egalitarians use to dismiss the scriptures on headship and submission. These men simply ignore the scriptures' command for all husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. This is the standard of headship. Christ-like, loving, selfless, self-sacrificing service to our spouse. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his great multiple-volume commentaries on Ephesians, says when he comes to this passage, this is the most revolutionary thing Paul says about marriage. It's not women submit to your husbands. It's husbands love at the level that Christ displayed at the cross, giving himself up. The problem is we've had many men who love the submission part, but they don't like the uh, leadership part of Christ-like leadership. And that's why many people are very confused about this, and they see us as fostering 
female abuse. <laughs> Two minutes? I'm going to work hard at that. Okay. <laughs> develop. Seven, develop a positive, encouraging environment for women in your church. I want to emphasize you as a body of leaders, set the tone. You set the environment. You set the spirit, the culture for the church. We should encourage our women to use their spiritual gifts to their greatest potential. Do not make what they can't do the focus of your church. All women need to be equipped for the ministry, the building up the body of Christ. All women are believer, priests, saints, and gifted servants of God. Eight, do not be embarrassed or apologize for believing God's good and beautiful design for men and women. Secular society doesn't have a lot to boast about. On the street level where most people live, the world offers to us an explosion of pornography and sexually transmitted diseases, abortion, an escalating drug and alcohol addiction problem, rampant divorce, marital misery, broken families, spousal abuse, sexual abuse of young girls, gender confusion. I heard 23% of California students are sexual, uh, gender confused. Growing teen suicide, fatherless America, and the most reprehensible of all, the alarming growing online child pornography sites. Do not be embarrassed by God's beautiful plan for a man and a woman. It leads to happiness and pleasure and glorification of God. Now, my last point, I'm so proud about this, I'm finishing on time. Do not be afraid of cultural intimidation. The pressure to conform to society's norms is enormous. It's the air we breathe. It's what we watch on TV. We can feel totally out of step with society. It can be very, very frightening. Very few people can stand against this pressure. No one likes to be rejected or treated as an outsider. That's why we need the local church. It's in the local church that we have safety and we have teaching and education and together we stand. No one can stand against this secular tsunami alone. We need the body of Christ. Also, if we leaders don't present a role model of Daniel-like courage and intellectual integrity, we cannot expect future generations to follow the biblical plan of manhood and womanhood. I just encourage you, another assignment, read Daniel's chapter 1, and then sing to yourself every day, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand along, dare to have a purpose firm, firm and dare to make it known. Oh, we need Daniel-like courage today. Be an example to the people of fidelity to the precious truths of the Creator's purpose and design for manhood and womanhood. Not everyone will reject the biblical vision for manhood and womanhood. Not everyone has fallen to their knees before Baal. Many non-Christians are seeing the growing perversity of society and they're not happy. We at this point can be God's voice to point them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ over all of life's issues. And most importantly, we can point them to the truths of the gospel, their greatest need. So, in closing, on time, be bold, be informed, be defenders, be teachers. Let's not fail our churches. Thank you, Alex. I'm David Fletcher, and I want to talk with you continuing on this serious topic of predators in the church, what you need to know. Now, if you want these slides, uh, let me advance. Uh, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to send them to you. This is what I'm going to share is based on a free online workshop that we're doing on Thursday. You're invited to come. You can enroll at the website. Last year, the topic of my major study was Smart Money for Church Salaries. I'll do a workshop on that uh, in an hour or so. This year, I've been studying predators in the church. How to get into this hard topic? Well, my dad used to say, there are lies, there are great lies, and then there's statistics. With statistics, we can prove almost anything, can't we? Or going from my dad to Joseph Stalin, <laughs> you know, Stalin, the, the head of the Soviet Union in the devastating time of the 30s, would say, one death is a tragedy. That's because you know the person. A million is a statistic. And now, unfortunately, I'm going to share some statistics with you, but we're going to personalize those. So let's go through a couple on sexual abuse. 
One girl in nine under the age of 18 will experience sexual abuse or assault from an adult. Another view, one girl in five, one in 20 boys, is the victim of child sexual abuse. Each year, 16% of youth between the ages of 14 and 17 are sexually victimized. See, we're already beginning to get numb, aren't you? Those are just numbers, and they're hard to personalize. Uh, this is from Rain. Uh, the statistic says 93% of those who are abused know their victim or know, know the one abusing them. So this is not something by, by these outsiders. It's generally by insiders. Another statistic, uh, all, of all victims under the age of 18, two out of three are between the ages of 12 and 17, very critical ages. This is perhaps the hardest one. Um, oops, I think I skipped one here. Sorry about that. Every nine minutes, Child Protective Services substantiates or finds evidence for a claim of child sexual abuse. Every nine minutes. So while Alex was speaking, that's two or three people. In this hour, we'll see six people who are confirmed. Now, how to, how to personalize this? How to bring it home? So what I want is a quarter of the room to stand. We're going to have this whole section. Will you please stand? And I want you to look at them and them to look at this group. This is how many people in your church, if your church has 600 people in it, this is how many people have been sexually abused in your church. You may sit down. So the next time you go and preach, you're speaking, you're teaching, you're leading a group of men or a group of women, one out of four in your church will have been touched, pardon the bad pun, by sexual abuse in your church. As Alex said, this is in every element of our society. It's in our churches, and we need to realize it. It's not a big statistic out there, but when you visualize it as a part of your church, it becomes very real. And if you want to bring it even closer to home, imagine that if you have four daughters, four women in your family, the statistics, if they're all averaged out, and there never are, but just imagine one of those four will be sexually abused. See, now that's not a million people out there. That's someone in your family. Not just your extended church family, but your home family. I won't do a standing example of this, but in America today, for every 300 citizens, one is a registered sexual offender. That means they've been convicted by the court system and found guilty and had their name go on the sexual registry. If your church has 300 people in it, that means most likely if you're following your community demographics, you have one registered sex offender in your church. And if they're not in your church, they're in your community, perhaps wanting to prey upon your church. Well, let's talk about another exciting topic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's see where this can go. We're going to talk about embezzlement. Tom Rayner will be with you this afternoon. Lifeway did research and found that 10%, when they phoned 1,000 pastors, 10% of them, 10% reported that they'd had financial fraud in their churches. We won't do the standing example, but imagine one person out of 10 standing and saying, we had financial fraud in our church. So there are both sexual predators and their embezzlers who are in your church, who are looking to steal and abuse your church. The hardest one, perhaps, is the active shooters. Tammy, my wife, and I went down to Sutherland Springs, Texas, about 90 minutes from our home in Austin, and met with the pastors there. Sutherland Springs had 60 people in worship in 2018. 26 were shot and killed that morning. And here's what their message to you is. Never say it can't happen here. Sullivan Springs doesn't even have a stoplight. I don't even know if they have sidewalks in town. 
It's just a small postage stamp, beautiful little Texas farming community. What's so alarming is in the year 2000, the FBI reports there was just one active shooting in the United States, and in 2017, there were 30. 4% of those happen in houses of worship. So the whole, the whole milieu, the environment that we live in has changed. Ten years ago, I would have never dreamed of talking about active shootings in, the, in churches. Child abuse, sexual abuse, yes, it's been going on for a long time. This is a new, new game. So what do we do? Well, I came up with eight elements of wolf thinking because the, act, the thing that you need to do is not just change your tactics. You must change your tactics. But you see, the predator, the wolf, is smart. This is not Harry and Marv in um, the wonderful, you know, what's now become a Christmas movie of Home Alone. Remember, they're always outsmarted by Kevin, and he does all those great traps in his house, right? And, and they're just dumb crooks. These are not dumb crooks. And let me tell you how you need to help change your thinking. So predators think differently than you do. They're highly intelligent. That's our first mistake when we think that they're not highly intelligent. Criminals are well-educated in street smarts, and sometimes in academia as well. Remember when Bitcoin was viewed as invincible? No one can steal from Bitcoin because it's double encrypted. It has all these things. And then what did we learn a couple of years ago? $340 million was stolen from Bitcoin. Never had your... How many people... Let's do this. How many people have had your credit card ripped off in the last year? Two years? Keep your hands up. Let's, let's just keep going. Five years? How many people... Put your hands down. How many people have have a credit card, and have never had it ripped off. Impressive. But notice how many of you had. How many credit card thieves are nabbed every year? Very few. See, these folks are smart. Predators make crime a way of life. They want to come into your church not because they want to be a, become a great bookkeeper or treasurer, but because they want to steal from your church. They don't want to enter your service in your children's ministry or youth ministry for altruistic reasons of serving Jesus. They're after what they want in their crime. Predators have self-control and logic. Even the child sexual predator has self-control because they only do their crime when they see great opportunity and a way of getting away with it. They have a logic to it. Predators come from all walks of life. It's just not... Folks from the poor side of the tracks, it's just not one race, one color. It is all over the map. Rich folks, middle-class folks, poor folks, always seeking to accomplish their agenda at your expense. And then they justify their actions. Everybody's sorry when they get caught. So there was a pastor in Houston, big church, audited frequently, and he stole $800,000. Of course, one of the things he did with that money is he got a D-min degree. He really did, Dave. He really did. <laughs> but he's sorry when he got caught. Not sorry enough to stop. Did you hear about the two nuns in uh, Los Angeles? I'm not picking on Catholics here. I just talked about a Baptist, and now we're talking about Catholics. So how much money do you think is significant to a nun? Just think in your head. I'll just give you what most people say to me, and they say, David, about $9,000 would be a lot of money to nuns. And the parish priest, when he wrote to the parents in the school, said, you know, these two sisters have stolen a significant amount of money. And I'm thinking, yeah, $9,000 probably. And they like to go to Las Vegas and gamble. And then it came out in the parents' meeting that these two nuns had um, stolen a half a million dollars. That's a lot of gambling in Vegas. That's a lot of losses. And then the parents got get together and watch out for the parents network. And so they began comparing backs of checks. And one mom said, I think it's $2 million. One dad said, well, my kids have been in this private school for years, and that's how they got the money. And um, I personally have given them about $50,000. Now think, if you're well healed, you make a lot of money, and, and the nun comes to you and says, we don't have enough money for tubas. And, and our kids need new sports uniforms. All right, here's a check for 5,000 bucks. Well, he did that 10 times. 
they probably stole upwards of $3 million tax-free. And they were very sorry when they got caught. They asked for forgiveness. <laughs> so they justify their actions. But predators love the thrill of the hunt. That is what is most exciting for the child sexual predator. We think it's about the sex. That's a part of it. That's like the icing on the cake. But the cake for all of the predators is the hunt. It's the thrill of the hunt. They want control over you. Wait, is that a biblical concept? Absolutely. It goes right back to the fall and before the fall. What did Satan say? I will. I will have power. And that is what the predator wants over you. It's not just your money, not your money, not just your body. It's not just killing you with the active shooters. They want to be more powerful than you are. Here's another one. Predators easily identify their victims. They are so good at that. Have you been in the room with someone who has this huge pastoral heart and, and they get your needs even before you need, know what your emotional and spiritual needs are? Well, that's the way it is with a predator. They are just walking the halls of your church. And so in South Carolina, 18 months ago, child sexual abuse went on. A volunteer had been in the church for less than six months. The videotape was rolling, and he still accomplished his crime for at least three months because that's what they had on videotape. See, predators get right in there, and they easily identify your vulnerabilities, and they're secretive and deceptive. They don't wear a big lapel pin right here that says, I'm a predator. They are personable, they are warm, and they are engaging. And that's why we need to change our thinking about predators so that we can think like them just enough to avert them. Now, Dave, come up and finish this trio of baseball hits. Hey, thank you, my friend. Well done. And good morning. How many here are morning people? Let me see your hand, please. You're here, you're here early, you're alive, you're awake. Uh, how many believe we ought to round those people up and make them go live on an island by themselves, right? <laughs> I'm a firm believer in the power of the Holy Spirit, but a little caffeine to get them going never hurt anybody. So it is a joy to be here. And, and we have uh, talked on some very, very serious topics, but could I start with one, uh, just maybe a theme for you to think about? Uh, how many figured out the hope of America is not in the courtroom? And by the way, we're close to Raleigh, but how many understand it's not in the State House? And I don't really care about your politics, but how many figured out it's not in the White House? How many believe it is in the church house? And you know, churches have the opportunity to be that salt and light and to deal with these things. And as you have heard about these issues, I think we can definitely theme very easily, times have changed in America. And, and sometimes in church groups, we resist that. We go, well, wait, the Word of God has not changed. How many rejoice the Bible's going to stand for all eternity? <laughs> but what these men are saying, very wisely so, is if you want to still act like it's 1970, how many understand your church is not going to thrive in these more complicated days? I mean, we can illustrate it a lot of different ways, but uh, uh, how many remember the old bus ministries of the 70s? What would we do? We'd find a vehicle that was deemed unfit for public transportation by the government. <laughs> Once they said they were no longer safe, we'd take them. <laughs> we'd then get drivers that had never driven anything that big. <laughs> we would load 90 children into 60 passenger vehicles without seatbelts. And then we would cheer for these felonies on Sunday night. <laughs> okay, that was the program. Uh, some of you may remember when we could uh, spank other people's children. <laughs> uh, let's do a little survey this morning. How many of you growing up were ever spanked by somebody you weren't related to? May I see your hand, please? <laughs> now we're like a support group. Okay, I mean, <laughs> churches spank, schools spank, neighbors spank. A total stranger would clock me. <laughs> My mother would go, thank you, he needed that. I... <laughs> Social services did not care. I, I mean, it was... And, and by the way, if I ever got spanked by somebody I wasn't related to, I had one prayer in life. You know what that prayer was. Didn't want my mother to find out. 
because I would explain how my civil rights had been violated, <laughs> and my mother would reviolate my rights. It never worked for me, ever. <laughs> but if you are in a church and your pastor comes to you and he says, I want to put you in charge of the child beating ministry, I want to tell you two quick things. Number one, your pastor doesn't like you. Okay, but number two, you're going to have a jail ministry on the inside. <laughs> and I think what these men have so expertly pointed out, lots of detail, lots of great information, times have changed in America. And we're not going to abandon the Word of God. How many believe we need to stand on the Word of God like never before? But we do need to recognize as we lead our ministries, and as we're, whether we look at our finances or our children's ministry or what we preach or teach on gender, different leadership roles, the training of our boards, it is so important that we recognize it's not 1970 anymore. Pastor came to me, said, uh, Mr. Gibbs had a couple, and they were sitting across from me in my office, and I had the pleasure of leading them to Christ. The woman in the relationship was a surgically altered transgender man and quite honestly as you were to look at this individual you would never expect them to be anything other than what I would describe as a somewhat attractive female. This man is legally married to another person, a man that they had met in the homosexual lifestyle and as they sat there across from my desk, just having trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, as their Savior, they looked up at me and said, Pastor, what do we do now? Now, if you go, well, Mr. Gibbs, I got it all figured out. I'm going to understand it's a tricky world. Well, go undo the surgery. Well, you can't always unmutilate mutilation. And, and by the way, who's going to pay for it? Are you going to take up an offering at your church? <laughs> you know, the undo the transgender fund? Um, quit taking the hormones. Well, now you look like a freak. Well, get divorced. How many understand that doesn't always feel right? And I think what has been so masterfully presented this morning is we're living in more complicated worlds. You're going to be facing trickier issues. Now, how many believe the Bible still has all the answers? And you say, Mr. Gibbs, what would you tell that preacher? I'll tell you what I said. I think most of you would agree with it. I said, preacher, you always get yourself in trouble when you start telling people what to do. Uh, how many believe you need to teach them principles and guidelines and then ask them what the Lord's leading them to do? They may have a lot of things. But then you have to decide, you know, as a church, how do you minister? And by the way, uh, how many believe you need to stay in your church lane? Okay, uh, number one, can they attend your church? And by the way, how many believe sinners ought to be able to attend church? <laughs> but now I'll get the phone call, you know, well, what about the bathroom, Mr. Gibbs? What about this? What about this issue? And so just want you to understand, uh, we should be reaching sinners of all types, but you always have the legal right to keep anyone out that you deem as disruptive. And how many believe that's a nice legal standard? It's not discriminatory. So somebody says, can we minister to a child predator? Well, maybe. Can you handle them and not be disruptive? And by the way, how many believe if, if a child is safe anywhere, they ought to be safe at church? And so you have to decide, can they attend? And then uh, number two, can they join? Now, if you're a membership church, that's an important decision. If you're an elder-run or a board-run church, it would just be the board. But can they become part of the voting decision-making group? And you say, well... And now you have to start deciding, you know, what are our standards? What do we believe? And, and I might just suggest uh, back in the 70s, we had an old standard. It was called the warm, breathing, and willing standard. <laughs> you know, and even if you weren't all that willing, if you'd show up, we'd take you, right? But now in today's world, I might suggest that you raise the bar a little bit and that you think about, you know, and, and I know like here at Colonial, they do an excellent job. There's membership classes and other things, but at least take the time to get to know the people. Uh, a lot of pastors that start interviewing prospective members find out that many of them aren't even saved. You say, I'm worried about the future of my church. Well, very important that the people that are going to make the decisions understand the truth of the Word of God. So make it a little easier to get in, and then let me give you a little practical, and this is a, on a legal side. Make it a whole e lot easier to get kicked out of your church. Okay, you say, what do you mean? Are you for church discipline? 
Uh, I'm a bigger fan of what I call automatic termination. Somebody does something, they're just gone. Uh, let me give you some basics. They don't show up. How many believe somebody doesn't show up is probably not going to be a good long-term church member? Um, let's go another one. They put something online that's in contravention to your church's statement of faith. You know, just make it, hey, you just made a public statement in contravention of our statement of faith, you're gone. And uh, I would just tell you, I've, I've litigated cases here in North Carolina, I've met people at meetings like this where, you know, it came down to one or two church members. Uh, how many believe we ought to guard that membership a little bit? And then uh, lastly, you have to decide who can be involved in leadership. And, and I know those are issues you think about, but I would certainly encourage you uh, to put the higher standard on leadership. And by the way, how many believe that's biblical? And, and somebody says, well, is that being judgmental? Is that being legalistic? Well, I would say in leadership, how many believe it's being smart? I mean, some guy that went to prison for embezzlement, uh, how many believe he ought not be counting the church money? And somebody says, well, you're being judgmental. No, I think at times we have to look at talents, gifts, and other things, and are they willing to hold to the standards? And again, if you're an independent church, you're looking for a new pastor, uh, how many believe uh, you need to be very careful in your hiring process? You know, criminal background checks, um, credit checks, reference checks. I mean, it's amazing how sometimes, as these men have articulated these statistics, predators, financial bad actors, ungodly people, probably unsaved people. As we know in Matthew 7, some people are going to cry out, I did works in your name, and God's going to say, I never knew you. Uh, but how many believe it's sad when they can jump from church to church? And so I would encourage you, as you are here this morning, uh, don't be discouraged about the evil of the day. The Bible kind of told us that. And how many rejoice as you look to the Word of God that uh, as you read the back of the book, how many are happy that we win? And so, as somebody says, Mr. Gibbs, you fight for victory. I have the privilege of fighting in victory. Uh, we know Christ has paid the price and has moved forward, and your churches are so very, very important. But I, I give you one more thought as you think about these issues, and, and these men have articulated it so well. You know, when I started, I'm an old 93 Duke Law grad helping churches and ministry as an attorney. Um, people would ask two questions. You know, number one, is it legal? And, and that's an important question. We want to obey the law. But then number two, the question would be, is it effective? Okay, is this working? You know, you can stand at the side of a street, you can scream at people, but, you know, it may be legal, but is it effective? Is it accomplishing anything? Is it really helping move what you're trying to do? But there's now a third question, and I just give this to you because it's kind of the, the cutting edge, and it's probably as great a threat to your church as the other two. What are the optics? How many understand the internet has changed the world? And we still want to ask the old two questions, you know, is it legal, is it effective? But I might challenge you, you know, not every message you preach should be on the internet. Um, and a lot of what you're doing as a church, you, you say we're gonna remove this person or we're gonna deal with this issue. Well, you may be 100% legal, it might be very effective, but you always have to be thinking about what are the optics? How are we being perceived? Uh, the old days, uh, we hate the sin, but we love the sinner. Okay, that worked in the 70s. The problem in today's world, the sinners now identify with their sin. You do not have a man stand up and say, I'm a man, and I prefer same-sex attraction. I prefer homosexuality. That's not how it's phrased, is it? You know what they say in the culture, I am a homosexual, I am a transgender, and they identify with their sin. So while we're going to stand, and we're not going to equivocate, uh, how many believe it's very important that our tone always be right? You know, I always say to folks, a successful stand has three elements, we're almost done. Make sure, number one, you're right. Uh, how many believe right will line up with the Word of God? Make sure, number two, you do it the right way. And, and uh, somebody says, we're pro-life, you know, let's go blow up an abortion clinic. Uh, how many see the problem there? God's kind of got like that top 10, you know, don't kills on it. So, you know, you want to do the right stand, but you got to do it the right way. But then number three, with a right spirit. A mother can say to her daughter, you are as dumb as a box of rocks. She may be right. The child might be limited in intellect. And we believe mothers should talk to their children. But what's the problem? You know this as pastors, counselors. You'd say her spirit is all wrong. 
her attitude. She's doing it out of anger. She's not doing it out of love. She's denigrating. She's hurting. Some might even say verbally abusing the child. That wouldn't be appropriate. But how many understand there's some pastors that do the same thing? And so when you preach the right stand done the right way, how many believe we always need to do it with a spirit that the Lord can bless? Certainly an honor to be here. Quick little commercial, National Center for Life and Liberty. Uh, we are legal attorneys that are available to you and your church. We do it as ministry partnership. Many of you do partner with us. Look forward to the workshops and more time here together, but I will turn it back to the gentlemen that are going to come up and pray.